The topic of pre-sapiens humans in Australia is a controversial and fascinating topic which doesn't receive the attention it deserves, especially in academic research. The Talgai skull, discovered back in 1886, remains one of the most puzzling human fossils ever found in Australia, not simply because of its age, but because of the morphological questions it raises about human origins in the region. Officially, it is the partial skull of a robust adolescent Aboriginal male, dated indirectly to around 13,000 years ago. Yet beneath that straightforward classification lies a far deeper mystery. The first thing to understand is that our image of the Talgai skull is frozen in time, literally. The original reconstruction, undertaken in 1916, has never been revisited with modern three-dimensional scanning or virtual restoration techniques. More than a century later, that 1910s interpretation still dictates how we view this specimen, despite the fact that significant crushing, distortion, and missing elements could have fundamentally altered its appearance. Without fresh imaging and digital reconstruction, we may still be working from a skewed picture, one that could make a relatively modern skull appear artificially archaic. The skull is dated to 13,500 years ago, but the stratigraphy and exact find location are questionable, and many paleoanthropologists have questioned this dating. When scientists measured the Talgai skull in 1916, they estimated its cranial capacity at about 1,300 cubic centimetres. Talgai's brain volume is firmly in the territory of later Homo erectus and overlaps with modern humans, if the measurements are accurate. And that is a big if. The skull is heavily mineralized and was damaged before and after discovery. Parts of the vault are crushed and distorted, the right side of the face is displaced, and the occipital region is fragmented. This damage has made interpretation challenging. In its current state, the forehead slopes back and the vault appears low, giving it an archaic profile. However, some of these traits may be the result of post-mortem compression. Early Homo erectus, such as the Javanese Sangiran skulls, had cranial capacities in the 850 to 1050 cubic centimeter range. Later populations, such as the Ungandong hominins from Java, or the Jokudian fossils from China, often reached 1,100 to 1,250 cubic centimeters. A handful of late erectus individuals may have crossed the 1,300 cubic centimeter mark, but this was exceptional. In other words, Talgai's cranial volume would have been unusually large for erectus. One of the most visually striking differences between Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and modern humans is in the supraorbital tori, the brow ridges. Homo habilis typically had relatively modest brow ridges compared to erectus, whose heavy, continuous bars of bone over the eyes became a hallmark of the species. Talgai's brow region is difficult to interpret, because of crushing and distortion. In its current state, the frontal bone slopes back in a manner reminiscent of erectus, but there is good reason to suspect this is partly the result of post-mortem compression. Measurements taken in 1916 showed the frontal bone at the glabella, the midpoint between the eyebrows, was an extraordinary 16 millimeters thick. In most modern humans, that figure is closer to 6 to 8 millimeters, this puts Talgai in the same range as thick-skulled Homo erectus from Java and China. Thick frontal bone could reflect genetic inheritance from a robust archaic population, adaptation to mechanical stress from heavy chewing, or both. The crushing of the vault is one of the central problems in reading Talgai's morphology. In the damaged state, the forehead looks low and retreating, giving the whole cranium an archaic look. But notes indicate this was not the original form. The distortion may have artificially depressed the frontal bone and altered the cephalic index, the ratio of maximum cranial breadth to maximum length. As measured, the cephalic index is about 73, indicating a long-headed, dolichocephalic form. This is consistent with many Aboriginal skulls, but also falls within erectus variability. Without a modern 3D restoration, we cannot know whether the vault was originally higher and more globular, which would pull it toward modern human morphology, or truly low and elongated, which would fit better with erectus. The need for reanalysis here is glaring. 
current methods could digitally correct the distortion, test alternative reconstructions, and reveal whether the skull's archaic profile is real or an artifact of preservation. But there has been no new research on this skull for 50 years, mostly due to cultural concerns. One of the most compelling arguments for a deeper, archaic component in Australia's human past comes not from Queensland, but from far to the northwest, the island of Sulawesi. Archaeologists there have recovered stone tools from deposits over one million years old, possibly as old as 1.5 million years. These artefacts could not have been made by Homo sapiens, who evolved much later. The most likely candidates are Homo erectus, long established on nearby Java, or an even earlier form, potentially related to Homo habilis. The significance of these tools lies in geography. Sulawesi sits well inside Wallacea, the island chain separated from both Asia and Australia by deep water channels. Even at the lowest glacial sea levels, these channels remained formidable barriers. The fact that early hominins reached Sulawesi means they had to cross open water. This implies either the construction of rudimentary watercraft or opportunistic rafting on storm-tossed vegetation mats. Either way, it was a deliberate or at least repeated act of sea crossing. If Erectus, or another primitive hominin, could reach Sulawesi 1 million to 1.5 million years ago, then there is no geographical or technological reason they could not have continued eastward. The island arcs of Wallacea form a stepping stone route toward the Sahul landmass, the combined Pleistocene continent of Australia and New Guinea. Once on Sahul, such a population could have spread into Australia, adapting to its varied environments and leaving behind descendants who might persist for hundreds of thousands of years. The face of the Talgai skull, at least what survives, is exceptionally robust for an adolescent. The cheekbones are large and flared, suggesting powerful chewing musculature. The upper jaw breadth exceeds 66 millimetres, rivaling adult Pleistocene Australians like Cow Swamp, and exceeding many recent Aboriginal examples. This is within Homo erectus range, particularly in Javanese specimens, whose palates were smaller even in proportion to their reduced cranial size. One hundred years ago, scientists noted that Talgai's upper canines were large and bore pronounced wear facets. At the time, under the influence of the Piltdown hoax and other outdated evolutionary ideas, these were interpreted as ape-like. Later re-examination suggested they fall within the upper range of modern human variation, meaning they are not exceptional for modern humans. Nonetheless, both Homo habilis and Homo erectus typically had larger canines relative to tooth-row length than modern humans, so the resemblance here is not meaningless. Perhaps more striking is the extreme wear on Talgai's molars, unusual for someone of about 14 to 16 years of age. This suggests a diet rich in hard or gritty material, a pattern seen in archaic populations who relied heavily on unprocessed plant foods or tough animal tissues. While not diagnostic of species, it aligns with a lifestyle more physically demanding than most late Pleistocene hunter-gatherers. Two crucial parts of the skull are missing or too damaged for reliable comparison, the mandible and the occipital region. The jaw is one of the best indicators for distinguishing between Homo erectus and modern humans. Without it, we lose data on chin shape, symphyseal angle and dental arcade proportions. Likewise, the occipital region is heavily damaged. In Homo erectus, this area often displays a pronounced occipital torus. If Talgai once had an occipital torus, it cannot be confirmed now. Given these preservation issues, including a crushed vault, distorted facial profile, missing jaw and fragmented occipital, the reliance on century-old physical reconstruction becomes problematic. In 1916, scientists could only work with plaster casts and manual measurements. Today, High-resolution CT scanning and virtual 3D modeling could digitally uncrush the skull, restoring symmetry, testing different fits for displaced fragments, and generating multiple reconstruction scenarios. Such work could show that certain archaic traits are entirely due to deformation, or conversely, that they persist even after correction, a crucial distinction for determining whether Talgai preserves deep archaic ancestry. The fact that no such analysis has been undertaken in over 110 years leaves us in a peculiar state. 
debating fine points of morphology based on a potentially flawed model. This raises an intriguing possibility. The Talgai skull, if correctly dated to 13,500 years ago, could represent not a pure modern human, but a descendant population with deep Homo erectus roots. Interbreeding with later arriving Homo sapiens could have produced individuals with modern-sized brains and generally human vault shapes, but retaining archaic robustness, thick cranial bones, and broad palates. Such hybrid scenarios are no longer far-fetched. Genetic evidence has shown that Homo sapiens interbred with Neanderthals, Denisovans, and other unknown archaic lineages. If similar events occurred in Pleistocene Australia, though the ancient DNA to prove it may never survive in the climate, morphological hints like those in Talgai could be the only surviving evidence. In its current state, the Talgai skull offers two competing narratives. The conservative view holds that it is a robust, late Pleistocene Aboriginal adolescent, distorted by burial and post-mortem damage into a superficially archaic form. The more radical interpretation sees it as the last visible trace of an ancient Homo erectus-like population long established in Australia and perhaps ultimately descended from hominins who crossed the Wallace line more than a million years ago. The truth may lie somewhere in between, but we will not know until Talgai is freed from the interpretive straitjacket of its century-old reconstruction. A thorough modern reanalysis, combining CT scanning, virtual restoration, and comparative morphometrics, could reveal whether the skull's archaic echoes are real or illusory. If they are real, then the adolescent from Dalrymple Creek would not just be a young man of the terminal ice age. He would be the heir to a seafaring lineage stretching back to the earliest explorers of the Australasian world, a lineage that began not with Homo sapiens, but with a much more primitive traveller, perhaps even one whose ancestors still bore the brain shape and smaller brow ridges of Homo habilis, yet had the audacity to cross oceans long before history began.